Today, we're going to start out a little bit differently than we normally do. I'd like to talk about inflection points for a minute. I'm not talking about the math version of an inflection point, but uh, the life version of it. And by what I mean by that is it's a turning point or a time of big change in your life. We've all had these. You might have met your significant other, your partner by a random meet at a bar or something like that. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about an inflection point I had. Uh, this one happened way back in October of 2012. I, I was really miserable at work. I, I had a very bad day. And I think my work probably would have actually killed me if I would have stayed there. It was just so much stress. I lost 10 pounds in a week. I barely ate. And I remember huddled over the toilet thinking I was going to throw up because it was that stressful. Towards the end of that week, I went on to Google and I think I typed in something like, how do I retire early? And I don't know what I was thinking, but I certainly didn't expect anything to come up. I think it was a life hail Mary. But up came Mr. Money Mustache. And I started reading it and it was about this guy who claimed to retire in his early 30s. I think he was like 31. And my first thought was, this is pretty much nonsense. I've stumbled upon some scam. But I, I gave the thing a chance, and I think the post that convinced me was the one about the 4% rule. And it was at that time I learned that math, that early retirement is just a pretty simple math problem. It's not even that complex. We don't need to go into that. You've all heard about the 4% rule. So the first thing I did after discovering this, and, and keep in mind all this happened within about an hour, is I was in my office. I ran out to the kitchen where Mindy was cooking, and I'm like, hey, you know how I'm so stressed to work? She's like, yep. I found this guy on the internet called Mr. Money Mustache, and he said that if we save a little bit more, we had already been savers, so we, we had a good nest egg already, but if we just save a little bit more, I can retire in like four years from now. And she's like, okay, that sounds good. And that wasn't the point of the conversation, but I'm so thankful that I had a wife who trusted me from this insane idea I found on the internet. And so I kept reading Mr. Money Mustache. I went through all his posts. And at some point along the way, I realized that he was a Colorado native and he lived only a couple hours away from me. And keep in mind, this was October of 2012. We had moved to Colorado back in April and we were deeply unhappy from the get-go. We didn't fit into our neighborhood. Uh, our kids didn't enjoy it. So within two weeks of moving there, of buying this house, it was back on the market and we were going to move back to the Midwest. But you can't, it's hard to sell a house after you just bought it because everyone thinks there's something wrong with it or up with it. So we, we were stuck there. But then I discovered this guy from the internet, this Mr. Money Mustache character lived in some place. And my thought at the time was, wow, I'll, I'll bet that place is a little bit better than where we are now. We seem to have similar values. And and maybe that place will be a little bit more interesting. So, so, so I go to Mindy again. I'm like, hey, remember that that mustache guy I, I, I found on the internet? She's like, yeah. She kind of looks at me suspiciously. I'm like, he lives in Colorado, like a couple hours away from us. She's like, okay. And then I said, I'm going to email him and see if he'll give us a tour of his town because we haven't sold our house. We haven't moved back to the Midwest and maybe Longmont will be a little bit better place for us. Maybe our values, the people there will have values more similar to ours. And she's like, uh, okay, you do that. This guy probably won't email you back. So that's exactly what I did. I sent Pete an email and uh, I logged on the next day and I didn't expect him to reply either. But the next day I had a reply from him. I'm like, oh my God, what what do I do now? This guy replied and he said something like, yeah, Longmont's pretty cool. You should come up here and take a tour of it. So I went to Mindy again. I'm like, yeah, you, remember that mustache guy? He said we should come up and take a tour of Longmont. I think she kind of rolled her eyes. She's like, okay, whatever, let's do it. But we're not moving to Longmont. So fast forward a couple months, we went up to Longmont, we met Pete. And I think I was kind of freaking up on the way, freaking out on the way there because I'm like, well, what happens if this guy from the internet is mean? Or what happens if he's a fraud? What if he stood this whole site up just to make money from it or something like that? I think I was actually shaking. I was so nervous. I'm, I was a lot more introverted back then than I am now. But then I met him and I think we spent the better part of the day with him, maybe four or five hours. We took a walk around town. Uh, we talked to some random people, his neighbors, and then he invited us into his house. And uh, after that, Mindy and I looked at each other and said, yeah, you know what? I We're not completely sold on this yet, but I think we should do a test drive here. We'll rent a place for six months, we'll see if we like it. And if we do, we don't have to make the move back to the Midwest. We can 
live out our, our, our Colorado dreams. So that's exactly what we did. And geez, that was back in 2013. So that was 10 years ago. And here we are right now, still here, happier than ever in Longmont. So this chance Google search led me to completely change my life by way of fire and completely changed my life by we live in a completely different area and uh, life turned out far different than it would be just because of that one little inflection point. I'm, I'm so thankful for it. Ed. I'm sure life would have been okay if I never would have done that search and would have moved back to the Midwest. We would have found happiness there, but I don't think it would have been quite as good as it is now in our life now. We, we have such a great community. I'm so thankful for it. Thank you, Mr. Money Mustache. This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. So I feel like this interview was a long time coming to interview Mr. Money Mustache. Yeah, Doug, we've been at it for two years. What are your thoughts? Do you think we should have tried to interview him sooner or later or... Ah, oh, gosh. Yeah, it was a little tough. You know, we really, we try to respect everyone's time. And, you know, Pete, as uh, one of our friends, we respect it even more. And I realize he probably gets pitched all the time. So I think waiting was good for us because it helped us get better as podcasters and interviewers. So I think waiting was a good move, even though maybe our show would be bigger if we interviewed him like in the first five episodes or something like that. What sure. about you? Yeah, it was still kind of strange and awkward uh, because Pete is a friend and he's also my business partner. We own the co-working space and it's kind of like asking a friend for money. You don't want the friend to feel obligated to give you that money just because they're your friend. So that part was a little bit different. So how we approach this one is I didn't really want to ask him the same shit everyone else asks him, like no 4% rule. No index funds, none of that stuff. Are you bored during your regular life? And all those questions that everyone else asks. So I think we took this to the next level. We're talking about life post-fi and happiness. And really, that's what the whole point of this thing is. The whole point is to get money to live your best life, to find out what really makes you happy and really gets you going where your passions are. And that's what we try to focus in on this. But yeah, I'm so thankful he agreed to it. I'm sure there's... Uh, there's news outlets like infinitely bigger than us. We, we are pretty big, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dozens of downloads per week or whatever. And it was cool too, because he, he said, um, ah, you know, my scheduling is a little funny. I can't come to the studio, which is in my basement here in the house. So he said, ah, why don't you come over to my house? And we actually had some, uh, some lunch. He's a fan of, uh, I think we can say Popeye's fried chicken, right? Yes. Very good. So we had a little lunch kind of gorged ourselves and then set up the mobile studio, which is just all the same stuff. I just had to move it over there and set it up, but it, it went well. And yeah, he, um, he was great to invite us over and, you know, be in his natural environment. Yeah. A quick side topic. Do you normally eat Popeye's fried chicken or? Uh, not, not super often. There's not a really close location. We actually live closer to, a another chicken restaurant from Georgia, where, where I'm from. Uh, so we eat there more often, which is fine. Um, but Popeye's, there's something special about it. It is pretty good. And the previous time I had it was when we had Pete on the podcast the first time for our for our uh, hot sauce tasting. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't have it a lot, but it is delicious. So I think that's a tradition. If we ever have Pete on it again, we always have to do Popeye's fried chicken. That sounds good to me. I think he's going to be into it. He seemed to enjoy it really well. So yeah. And actually, you know, we're not going to uh, belabor this too much more, but a couple quick uh, notes. So we do a sound check and I thought it'd be good to do a, uh, a mock interview with Pete since he's probably not going to work at another place or ever have to interview again. So that's at the very end of this interview. So if you want to hear Pete answer real mock interview questions, um, he's a, he's a good interviewee, I would say overall, and I would hire him. We actually made a job offer to him. So definitely check that out. 
And if it's your first time listening, thanks a lot for checking out Mile High Fi. We have done a lot of other interviews, so I definitely recommend you check out some of the others, some very well-known folks uh, like Branded, the Man, Mad Scientist, JL Collins. We have J.D. Roth. We've also talked to Paula Pant from Afford Anything, Rachel Richards. And can you think of any other folks that we've... Uh, yeah, I think those are probably the very, the biggest ones. But yeah, lots of great interviews. Uh, Eric Peterson was one of my favorites. Uh, some of our local interviews are, are, are probably the best ones, actually, because we know these people and we spend time with them so we can ask really good pointed questions. Uh, Jake was another good one. JT, who you're having lunch with today, not at Popeye's. Right. Yeah, yeah. So a bunch of good ones. And I'll link up to the, you know, the well-known and some of our most popular episodes in the show notes and description. So you can check it out if you want to. And I think without further ado, let's hear from uh, Pete Adney. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. And we have a special guest today. Tell us who you are and what you do. Um, I'm Mr. Money Mustache, and I mostly just go on other people's podcasts these days. <laughs> and you have a, blo a little blog too, right? Yeah, I still have a blog that is on the internet. And uh, yeah, in fact, I've recently added something to it. So I consider it, it to be an active blog again. blog again. Fantastic. Well, I kind of view this as a number one, a great opportunity. So thanks for taking time out today. But I know a lot of people listen to your interview on the Tim Ferriss podcast. And I'm maybe some big shoes to fill, but I kind of envision this as like 2.0 because you don't do many interviews out there these days. And I remember on this podcast, February 2017, you mentioned that you had um, an idea. If you had to spend some money, you would buy a building on Main Street in Longmont. Yeah. Currently, you actually own a building on Main Street. It's a co-working space. I'm a member of it. And it's been the source of like my community and friends. In fact, like we're coming up on Christmas. I'm going to be spending time with most of the people that I know from the co-working space. So yeah. can you tell us about the story of getting 712 Main Street? Yeah, that's funny. So first of all, I mean, I'm sure the Mile High Fi listeners know that my co-owner is sitting here, one of my co-owners sitting with. So it's not me owning the building. But that is quite funny because, uh, yeah, the Tim Ferriss podcast was a long time ago, and that was before that dream came to fruition. So later in 2017, uh, happened to be perusing Craigslist, looking for real estate deals, and there was just this really cryptic ad that said, 712 Main Street, $230,000 or something like that. I was like, oh, that's weird. That's a really low price for local real estate. And I happened to recognize the address as being on Main Street, <laughs> like it's downtown. So I went and it was like hard to get in touch with these people because like people who make bad Craigslist ads are also usually not good at communicating. But we worked through the hurdles and then because of, uh, because of the difficulty, we ended up getting it super, super cheap. And it was a, like to say it was a fixer upper is definitely an understatement. Like this building was barely even functional. It was owned by a gentleman who lives far away. And that was like the last forgotten piece of his real estate property. Uh, portfolio. So anyway, in exchange for getting it, you know, like kind of at half price, we had to do a bunch of work to fix it up. And um, originally I bought it with different set of friends and there was like half of it was a soap and crafting shop. And then a little part was a co-working space. And then eventually the soapers and, and crafters moved off to their own spaces and they gave, that gave me the opportunity to buy the rest of it. So I invited Carl and Mindy and our other friend Bill to come like co-invest and basically buy out these other partners. And that's how we ended up owning the whole property, which is like this big piece of land with, you know, like a building on it that is patched together of different generations. A lot of detail in the story, I realize. I'm... So anyway, fast forward, we fixed it up, brought a, brought a lot of people in, like, you know, just through word of mouth, basically. And then we have a membership varying between like 50 to 70 people, you know, goes up and down depending on how much work we put into it. And, um, but the most valuable part, you know, that, that's really nice. And those people are super, it's wonderful that they have a place to work and to sustain it, but where the headquarters really shines is we have these big events as well, like pop-up business school, or we'll have authors like Jim Collins, you know, friends and authors will come and give a talk. And then we open it up to the community, like not just members. And the most powerful feature 
that we have at our disposal is not created by me. It's actually by our friend, Michael, who set up a, a meetup group, you know, on meetup.com. And it's called Northern Colorado Mustachians. And um, it has something like 1,400 people now. And that's all people who are in our area, you know, Denver and Boulder and Fort Collins. So we can just type up like a, dis, you know, description, like campfire and booze at the headquarters this Friday. And like, you know, however many tickets you make available, we make them free tickets. Uh, they always sell out. So you can get like 50 or 60 or even 100 people depending on the event. And then you have this huge crowd of of brand new, like old and new friends alike. And it allows people to mingle and mix. And, you know, it's a great way to meet people, a great way. You know, it's, it's also like even a bit of a dating scene because a lot of people are like looking for partners in the fire community and they're tired of like the consumer right. mentality that they'll find on the normal dating sites. So like I've seen lots of things like that happening at, at our events too. So to me, it's a really a dream come true because it's a social space and the building is really just a venue that allows us to have these nice social spaces because none of us has a house big enough to, to do that all the time. It's amazing. Yeah. Really enjoy the co-working space. I don't even work there, but uh, it's all the the community stuff and hanging out, yeah. happy hours and all that stuff. Right. I mean, we're thinking of rebranding it like Carl and Mindy and I already talked about this and calling it a social club instead of a co-working space because co-working space, people are like, well, I don't need a place to work. And, and we're saying like, that's good because we wouldn't have room for 60 people to work there anyway. But because our dues are so low, it's just enough to sustain the building itself so we, we like to think of it as more of an events and a social club. And I'm trying to get, you know, the real thing it needs more is just people planning events that aren't just me and Carl. Because Carl and I are always like just home and hanging out with our families or, you know, working on our own houses and we forget, you know. So we need more people to plan events because it really could be an amazing social venue the more people are thinking of it that way. And I did... Um like a small SEO talk. And I remember in the interview, you mentioned like, oh, it'll be cool to have like some educational stuff, which like you said, it's tough to organize it. I was a little nervous if anyone was going to yeah, show up at all. I remember that event. I thought there were going to be five or six. It was about 20, a little overwhelmed, but it was a good event. And I, I need to do another, but yeah, it's one of yeah. those things. Cool. So, well, Carl, you're part of the ownership there at HQ. How'd you get roped in? And you can rewind and, and tell us a, a tale here if you want. Yeah, I think I saw it all went back to I was uh, perusing Twitter and I saw a tweet from Pete and I can't remember exactly what it said. Maybe just something I'm looking to expand the co-working space. And, and I sent you a note. I didn't think you'd be interested actually, but I thought, yeah, what the hell? I'll, I'll send Pete a note and see if he's interested in having a partner with this. So I did that. He's like, oh, sure. Let, let's talk about that. And I'm like, oh, shit. It's like the dog that catches the car. Like, what, what happens now? <laughs> I, I didn't think he'd say yes to it. But now here we go. And uh, yeah, let's do it. And we did it. And it's been, God, I don't know. How many years ago was that now? I think we started our co-ownership co in January 2019. Okay. So it's just coming up on four years. I'm a, I'm a recovering pessimist and probably not an optimistic person by nature, <laughs> although I've changed that about myself. I'm much better, but yeah, um, I was slightly worried, like, what if there's conflicts and stuff like that? But it's been great. Like, man, it's been such a positive experience. Some of my, uh, I used to think I was kind of a, a loser and I, I probably still am. Let's not, let's not <laughs> beat around the bush, but like all my friends are like people I know, like through the co-working space or I've met them or the people I hang around with most in life. And I, I think I've come to believe that's how friendship works or that's the lie I tell myself. Mm. Geography is a big component, but oh, yeah. got something like the HQ for the most part, people join that because they found it through the Mr. Money Mustache blog. So you've passed through a filter and you're probably going to have, your values are probably going to be pretty similar. So it's a lot easier as someone like me who is kind of terrified of people to just sit down and have a conversation with a total stranger. You met this person a minute ago, but you know you're going to have stuff in common. And I totally went off track. You asked me how I got involved. But <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's been so good on, on, on many levels. I'm sure it'll be good. It's been good financially. We own property on Main Street. Uh, it brings in recurring revenue, and it brings in lots of great people. And I think we make the community a little bit better. There, there's people, I call this the Mr. Money Mustache Tractor Beam. There's people, including myself, who are in Longmont right now because of Pete. And I've met plenty of other ones like that. It's pretty interesting. I'm sure you've 
screwed up real estate prices here at least a little bit, or, or I shouldn't say screwed up, that's the wrong word, <laughs> elevated them a little bit. Yeah, it's a Ponzi scheme benefiting us because we already had our houses and then everybody else <laughs> moved here. But, it's um, fantastic here in Longmont, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, it, I'm never a over booster of Longmont. Like I moved here because it was cheap at the time. <laughs> and then it's not cheap anymore. So, you know, the community here is great. And it does have like a lot of the Colorado benefits. But if you're going to have to pay $600,000 to live here, like it seems to be the case now, then I would encourage people to go move on to other frugal destinations like, you know, Southeast or Cincinnati. Like, you know, as a because there's a lot of great towns to live in. And I, I kind of, one of my goals is for people to spread out from the expensive places and revitalize these small towns like cotton mill towns and, you know, places that were booming in the early 1900s. And then they're forgotten now just because they don't have like a Google office there anymore, but they're still fundamentally beautiful places to live. And now that you can work from anywhere remotely in so many jobs, uh, there should be more moving around happening. And we have a lot of topics to cover today. We're going to get into happiness and fire in general, a couple other things, but largely about happiness. Before we move on, I think we can cover a couple more questions we have about the co-working space. And I wonder if there's anything that's been harder than expected with the co-working space, whether it's specifically working with Carl, <laughs> no offense, uh, but or just like growing membership or the yeah. shape of the building or whatever. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question because, so first of all, the co-owner situ situation has been better, as Carl mentioned, better than we could have hoped. It's just four years, completely conflict-free. You know, we just kind of joke together. We chit-chat on Discord and we're like, oh, should we get a new, you know, microwave for the headquarters or should we put in a heat pump this year? And everyone's like, yeah, sounds great. And everybody always says yes to each other's ideas. So that part is excellent, no problem. The only place we fail uh, to be transparent is I think Carl and I are both, and Win Mindy too, we're each doing our own thing and sometimes that's not the headquarters. So like it it suffers from a lack of attention from us. And so there's not as many events as there could have been. And there should there really should be a happy hour like every Friday, come on. Like there's mm -hmm. 60 people. If we were doing that kind of stuff and we had like a really vibrant community manager then we'd probably have like 100 to 200 members and then the place would really be buzzing all the time. So in fact, if people are listening to this and you want kind of a, an honorary role as a community manager at our headquarters in exchange for some perks and free membership and, you know, could even be a paying job, I guess, if we got enough members, um, then yeah, get in touch through the Mile High podcast or to my, to my blog because we would love to have basically an extroverted person who loves meeting people, happens to live in this area already and is just looking to make stuff happen. Cause it's like, it's like a field full of gunpowder and it's just waiting for somebody to spark it up. But with these middle-aged dudes, uh, with these busy lives running it, we don't have quite the motivation that, that other people would to make more stuff happen. Carl, do you, anything more difficult than you expected? Um, yeah, I, I tend to keep myself too busy, which I'm dialing back. We've talked about that, Doug. I'm not buying any more houses to fix up. I'm done with that. <laughs> so it, it made me kind of sad. I was thinking about it a couple of weeks ago, and you kind of alluded to this, Pete, like I don't spend enough time there. And I used to. I used to come work out of there two or three days a week. So one of my goals for 2023 is to wrap up all my home projects and just be there regularly because uh, what makes a co-working space is the community. People don't go there to work, they could just do that in their kitchen or their home office. They do that because they want to be surrounded by other humans. Therefore, you need a critical mass of people in there to have those connections and to have good conversations. And they're like, I've seen the magic when it happens. I remember there was one time where one person was in there and uh, he worked on this website called bringatrailer.com, which is where you sell fancy cars in it. And it got its start through selling, like, I think Porsche 911s, the old air-cooled Porsches. And this other person was in there, and she's like, oh, she's like, wow, my dad has an old Porsche that I want to sell. And these two people start talking to each other. So these magical little connections like that. But to make them those happen, you need to have people there in the first place. You need to have the vibrant community. It's not that we don't. We could just... Uh, pump it up a little bit if we had a little bit more, like Pete said, effort, someone to propel this along. Cause. And on that note, maybe when you're going, you should just put a note on our like 
our owner's channel or something in advance. Like if you know at least an hour in advance when you're going to go, because that'll get me out of the house more often because mm. I'm like, oh, Carl's going to be there. That'd be nice. And then that would already increase the amount of us being there, which I think makes other people feel more excited, you know, when they're in there too. So they'll come more often. Yeah. Okay. And then we can also share things with members. Like, you know, we'll plan more events and mm -hmm. the workout group is probably on pause because we've had some extremely cold weather, but <laughs> things that happen there regularly is, yeah. is a really a key. Yeah. I think we're making stuff happen, guys. Yeah. And this is amazing. I know we're making other people <laughs> listen to our inner business meetings right now. All right. Uh, a couple other questions with that. So any benefits that you didn't anticipate? So I think you probably knew there were going to be uh, some good community aspects, maybe meet some friends, Any anything unexpected? Um, well, it's been good for my, without getting too detailed, it's been good for my personal life, let's say, as a man who went through a divorce, you know, shortly after buying the headquarters for the first time, I feel like it's a good place to, you know, a good place to meet mm -hmm. a new partner. <laughs> without cool. not too many details beyond that sure cool and, but yeah you can't understate the value though of meeting people that you really connect with and really care about like that is an excellent um thing to have in your life one way or the other which it doesn't it doesn't just mean you don't have to be the owner to have the benefits of that just having anybody who's a member of a social club like that mm -hmm. can have the same things if they just get out of the house and do it it's a good filter. Yeah. Like you, you were saying, I mean, with the, the meetup group, it's all people that are into the same stuff that we are usually uh, a lot of overlapping interests and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. We go hiking. I mean, uh, I, I don't get the dating benefits cause I'm married, but, uh, <laughs> I've got solar panels on my house. I know I install a heat pump because of the HQ and, and the other members there who have helped me do stuff. So I'm so thankful for it. Well, are you ready to shift to happiness here? Yeah, let's do it. I wrote out this outline. I didn't tell you we were going to pitch you, but I was thinking about it, Pete. I'm like, eh, you know what? I don't want to talk about index funds or the 4% rule. That shit has been gone over enough. And uh, I've thought a lot about your blog in the past, and I think it's a lot. It's about a lot of different things. I think the hook that gets people in there is money, but I think it's like down deep, it's really about happiness because a lot of this stuff, like if you get money right and you get all this other stuff, right? You're just overall going to be a, a happier person. It turns out it's all related to a lot of, there's a lot of common themes in there, like efficiency and having a small footprint and uh, not being a big consumer. But I think at the end, it all comes down to happiness. Would you agree or am I full of shit? Yeah, you're definitely right. And it's part of that has been my own journey. Like over the 12 years of writing this blog, like at first I was a 36 year old, right? When I was writing it. So I'm like, I'm excited to be early retired and I'm going to share some of these lessons about money. And then as I went through that, I realized like, well, why do we care about having money? And like, what else? And I was increasingly like spending more and more years as a early retiree and realizing like, what are the challenges in life and what is it that makes life joyful and why am I happy to be retired and, and what problems still come up despite being financially all set. So that's why my writing has changed and moved on to talk more about these things. And yeah, it really helps to understand happiness from like what it really means and what it causes, what causes it in humans and what causes unhappiness and stress. So it's super cool. So I go through like all these books and other podcasts and things like that, that teach you those things and I can bring home the lessons and try to share it with my readers and then get them interested in the same stuff. So it's really just like one man's journey through through life and like successes and failures and then trying to package them up as life lessons, which is why it's not really, you know, about any one particular thing. And then what it really comes back to is if you, for me being like a science oriented thing person, I think of everything in terms of, of science. So understanding myself as a creature, like a human being and uh, how other human beings, we have these similarities. The more you understand humanity itself and like how, how we evolved and why we exist, you know, with our preferences and like, why do we love some things and hate other things? If you understand that better, then you can make your life meet the natural conditions of being a human better. And the cognitive biases are one of these things too. It helps you avoid falling into the traps that everybody falls into. So a really fun project is learning about humanity, applying it, design your own life to press the right buttons. And then you end up with, I think, with like a happier and happier life, the better you get at this interesting skill. Yeah. Um so at the most basic level, happiness is a chemical reaction in the brain. Therefore, 
we act in certain ways to create that reaction in the brain. But uh, I should back up a second. What is happiness to you like? Uh, I don't know if that's a shitty question or not, but what is a happy day? Or is there a better word for it, like contentment maybe? Yeah, that's true. There's Some people use different words, like happiness researches. There's like joy, and then there's fulfillment and meaningfulness, and like they all mean slightly different things. And then there's pleasure, which is kind of the more simple things, just like, you know, you get this great steak dinner and a strong whiskey or whatever. <laughs> and that's like those kind of things are moment-by-moment moment pleasure, and by understanding how all those things re relate and how to seek each one in the right quantities, that's more likely to be a recipe for, for long-term happiness. Because of course the, the shortest term happiness would just be like taking, you know, a drug like heroin or cocaine or whatever, because like your, your hormones are flooded just for that few minutes. And you're like, oh, I feel on top of the world. I feel great. Right. It's like the most shallow form of happiness. But objectively, your life is going to suck more and more the more you do these things. So the challenge is thinking about like the short term and the long term and designing a life where you feel as good as possible over like, you know, on average over the longest period. So to do that stuff, it's much more like my most recent blog post from uh, Andrew Huberman's teachings, um, stuff like outdoor access and sunlight and activity and health and food and sleep. All those things are like much more reliable sources of life happiness. And of course, social, you know, friends and yeah. meaningful connections and being nice to people. So a pretty long list, but it, it, what it really breaks down to is a, a package of activities that you try to put into each day as often as you can. And that ends up being, you know, on average, a pretty nice, happy life that can keep getting better and better. Yeah. So, so I've got one more thing, Doug, then I'll turn it over to you for a minute. I think a lot of things in modern life, like we're richer than ever, but a lot of the things that have resulted from that actually make us less happy. And I'm thinking about this, this worker I had at my second job, he was from China. And he's like, I grew up in this tiny house in China. We were super poor. It had dirt floors. We lived with my parents, my grandparents, so we had th three generations of people in this tiny house with no plumbing. And he's like, but do you know what, Carl? I'm like, no, what? <laughs> he's like, I was happier. I was much happier there than I was here. And here his wife was like a PhD working for a pharmaceutical company. They have this big fancy house, they have yeah. fancy cars. But he said he was more happy there than he was in modern society. And I thought that was, at first I was like, what are you talking about? You're full of it. But now, <laughs> especially... Uh, it, in light of our conversation a moment ago about the co-working space and the community, I think we've lost a lot of what makes us really happy, unfortunately. What, yeah. What do you think? But it's such a, once you study these things, you realize what people are doing wrong. So your coworker there was just definitely doing it wrong. You've probably worked too much. You probably didn't have enough friends in his life, you know, fam family, friends, community, like the modern life, the fact that we have so much money is really that should be a super charging factor that it lets you be happier if you do it right. You know, for example, we now we can afford a house where you can have your friends over. Having your friends over is a happiness booster. Or we can afford a car, which lets us see more friends, and that can be happy. But if you're just using your car to drive back and forth to a job that's like 30 miles away, then it's like it's a technology, but it's not helping you to do these fundamental human things. It's not making you more sociable or you know, you could get the same, if you, if you could get the job closer to home, then you'd be spending, you'd get the same benefits of the income, but without this, you know, like stress inducing danger, health destroying activity. So yeah, I feel like the basic skills uh, are not out there enough. And it would be really nice if we could, you know, like distribute flyers or have preachers who, who teach these basic skills a lot more. I see a lot of people who are, you know, in our group, people are pretty familiar with this, but when I come across other high income families who aren't well versed at happiness, they're, in my opinion, they're just doing everything wrong. And it's like, no wonder you're having health, happiness problems and health problems. You're just doing everything wrong. It's like so obvious. Yeah. You should be one of those crazy people, like on a street corner with a <laughs> megaphone. Like yeah. at a lot of it, I think yeah. there are religious entities, but you could be just like a happiness guy. You could be shouting happy thoughts at yeah. people and give people unwarranted or, uh, <laughs> unsolicited advice. Yeah. That would be a nice, yeah, much more stressful way. I mean, I'm doing that effectively, but I'm just typing it into the computer right now, which is uh, a little easier than going out with a megaphone and more effective too, because it reaches more people than, than your voice. So before we, um, before I ask 
this question. For the people that are listening, we'll describe this. So you're sitting next to what looks to be a cloth horse head thing. Do you want to <laughs> tell us a little about that? People on YouTube can see this. Well, uh, I'll take a picture so we can capture this. It's yeah, important. well, this is maybe you can have a picture <laughs> well, when you're when you're doing the when you're doing like the official marketing shots. Okay, so this horse, uh, whose name is Horsey, has a special place in my heart because my older sister, who's like eight years older than me. Uh, made this when she was in seventh grade. So like a long time ago. This is like a, a 50-year-old horse. And uh, oh, wow. still looks as fresh as the day it was made. And it's partly just an ongoing joke. So my sister's name is Heather. And I remember finding this in my mom's attic, you know, when my mom was moving houses. And then Heather's like, oh, wow, I can't believe mom saved that. Like, I didn't even <laughs> remember I made that in home ec class. I'm like... This is my favorite horse. I'm going to keep this forever. So ever since, I've been making sure it shows up in stuff so that my sister can see her horse having a good life here in Colorado and get continually reminded about it. High quality. Yeah. yeah. Looks like it was well made. In fact, you know what's cool about this is uh, it actually has a hollow, a hole in the bottom, and it's designed to go on a broomstick. Okay. So you can ride this horse around. Functional. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess I wouldn't expect anything less. It's not just all beauty. <laughs> Do you ever put it in someone's bed like the famous scene from <laughs> Godfather? No, but now that you mentioned that, it's going to go in my son's bed, so he'll see it tonight. When he goes to bed. Okay, so back back on track. You mentioned that um, you know your blog shifted from more personal finance ideas to more happiness and uh, maybe parables and such. Mm, parables, yeah. You also said it's kind of like your journey through life. Can you? I don't know how to ask this exactly, but like, how have you changed from the beginning of the blog to now, now that you've studied happiness for years? I think, uh, well, first of all, I've been really grateful that this happened to me because when you're writing a blog, you kind of, it's like an online diary in a way. And then, so people are paying attention to your life and you want to, I want to have things to tell them. So it actually makes me go and seek things out and live a better life so that I'll have something to talk about. So in a way, it's sort of like if you're the host of a fitness show, you can't, you have to remain fit in order to be a valid host of that show. So they get a benefit. So I'm like a happiness host. So in a way it's made me get to live a better life because of that. And so I just read a lot of books and practice things and listen to things and watch documentaries. And what it has helped me do is just identify all these flaws that I already had in terms of like, oh, you get mad at certain things or frustrated that you don't need to get mad. Like it's, it's actually just hurting yourself. So learning to be more chill and understand other people, you know, being an engineer and being kind of like inward focused and logic focused, I used to be more frustrated with, you know, all these fleshy humans who with their emotions and how pesky that was. And like, what do you mean you don't want to, you know, like do all these behaviors? Like it's more logical to do these behaviors. Now I understand um, how humans work more and it lets me behave more like a human as well. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think that's nice. It's like everybody should have this luxury of getting to learn about themselves and it helps to just helps me become more mellow, right? Like my biggest flaw was that I was too judgmental and, you know, small minded when I was younger, I think. So the less I get like that and the more open and more Dalai Lama like I can be, over time, I think that's better for me and better for anybody who has to deal with me as well. Carl, do you have anything like that? What's your journey like? Because uh, I know you've been studying some of the same ideas, right? Yeah. I mean, I can relate to what Pete just said because um, I used to be, and I still am too judgmental, but when people do stuff that I don't perceive to be the best way to do it, sometimes I'm judgmental. I was complaining to you about someone driving on the way over here today and uh yeah, when I see that, I get mad. But it's silly to get mad at one person. Well, it's silly to get mad at all, but especially to get mad at someone based on a 10-second interaction. They have, if they're 50, they have 50 years of history that you know nothing about, and there might be a reason they're acting in that way. And I'm just thankful that I've been able to work on myself. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure where else to go with that. But. Yeah. Well, sometimes people driving around in traffic, they are motherfuckers and you don't want to, I mean, <laughs> it sucks sometimes. We're all assholes when we're driving though. Like all the, everybody's impatient. It's one thing that's kind of interesting. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like the, uh, the, the frog and water thing. You don't often realize how great your life is until 
you force yourself to think about it. So I was thinking about the driving thing. Like I used to drive every day, like significant to my stupid job. And now I don't have to do that. Yeah. And I'm so thankful. So the fact I get mad so quickly when I'm driving is actually a good thing because I don't have to deal with this stuff. So trying to reframe stuff and have have gratitude, and it makes me realize how much I really hate driving too. Man, <laughs> getting in the car. Is just, yeah, right. Ugh. Driving does suck, except when you're like have a car full of friends and you're blasting through the mountains and you're going yeah. to a cabin, you rent it or whatever. Like that's the only time driving is good. Other than that, it's just a result of the poor planning is how I phrase it. Mm-hmm. So when I'm in the same situation, you know, someone's like stopped in the middle of the road for no reason. Instead of getting mad at them, I'm like, okay, first of all, they are a crappy driver, but <laughs> who's the sucker who put himself into a car today? And whose mm-hmm. fault is that? It's my fault. You know, like you probably could have biked today if you thought about it more properly. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I blame myself and use that as a way to improve myself instead in my habits so that I don't have to drive in traffic as much. So, so Doug, you seem super chill, maybe chiller than either of us. Um, <laughs> oh, do you have any advice for us? You're a pretty mellow. Like I can't picture you mad, actually. I, oh, I don't yeah. know if I've ever seen you Thanks. angry. <laughs> you know, it's a ton of weed. No, I'm just kidding. No, just kidding. So I think, so I actually have a really bad temper and it like runs through my family. So I was hyper aware of that and I've tried to just go the opposite direction. Still have a temper and when it flares up, it's bad, but Mm -hmm. usually I, uh, you know, suppress it deep inside (laughs) and push all those feelings. Uh, but, but seriously, I try to just be chill because I know I have a temper. The other thing, um, is actually recently just today. So I have like some light family situation going on. Everything's cool. I'll tell you guys about it off the record, (laughs) but my wife was getting a little, little annoyed. And I was like, you know, I, I can only choose how I react to a situation. I can't control what other people do at all. I can't control anything except how I react to it. Very Zen. And then I was like, oh yeah, like actually this makes sense for me to handle it this way. And then actually that made her upset. She was like, (laughs) she's like, yeah, yeah. yeah." She was like, no, no. Like she got upset and she like understood, but, but yeah, I was like, I can only control how I'm reacting. I can't control the other person who is maybe irrational or whatever. And I'm not talking about her in this case. (sighs) Um, But I was like, I think I am trying to make that sort of the North star. So then I can be chill. I can only choose how I am reacting. Yep. That's classic wisdom. And then I felt really smart after saying it, but seriously, she got pissed off and I was like, Oh, that's, that's a weird thing to get upset at. So now, now that I'm saying it, I'm like a lot of people will probably listen to this episode. So I'm just going to retract (laughs) <laughs> but yeah i i have a bad temper but usually i just try to stay calm yeah okay yeah older you get the older you get it usually gets easier to do these things as long as you're self-aware and you're working on it so and then that it gets super funny because if you see someone who is the same age as me like 48 now and they still have the temper i'm like oh this guy is i mean what's wrong with him he has he's had so many years to practice and he's still getting mad all the time it doesn't happen very often though, because we kind of have a bubble of friends where everybody is is working on becoming mellow and working on, you know, learning to share the blame, the blame with themselves. And so, yeah, it's it, it's remarkably nice people you end up with if everybody is working on it. Mm-hmm. I kind of like Jocko's viewpoint. What's and, I, and now that I say that, I can't remember his exact words, but like, uh, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Like. Uh, Give us some hints. Accountability or whatever yeah, he extreme says. Extreme like, ownership. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to own it no matter what it is. I'm going to have a... He always says good, like no matter what the situation is. Yeah. It's like, good, we'll, we'll handle it. But mm-hmm. the, the ownership part of it too, like, okay, I'm not going to point fingers at anyone. Let's just get it done. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, that that's something that I had to figure out too, because there are, again, some, some people in my life, they would always blame other folks. So it's like, always pointing fingers. It's always someone else's fault. There's always an excuse. But like, if you remove the excuse and you're like, it was some decision I made, it's not always your fault, but like, usually it's some decision that you make that puts you in the position, like the people that are uh, making us uh, late in traffic or whatever, like you maybe didn't have to get in the car that day or whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Extreme ownership is a nice, it is a really good philosophy. And I like to apply that to health too, because you know, like in the U.S., there's so many different 
health problems. And then there's a lot of people will be quick to point out, well, you can't always control it because you could have a genetic you know, predisposition to something. So like, of course, it's not absolute. But at the same time, if you put all that aside and just say like, I'm responsible for my own health, nobody else is. So I'm going to make decisions as if, as if there is no other factor. You know, even if I have a genetic this or that, that's not the part that I'm working on. I'm working on the part that I can control. And so there, if I ever have anything, you know, any health problems, I, I try to own it. I'm like, well, guess what? You, you were drinking a couple of weeks ago or you, you know, you haven't been perfect in your health and you can always do better. So you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to beat yourself up. But by just acknowledging that you can always do better, that encourages to be you to live as if you're in control of your own health. And like over the long run, I'm convinced that'll just result in a lot less problems. You know, you're going to minimize the amount of stuff that's unavoidable. And yeah, as you get older, that becomes more of a factor because stuff can really start to pile up. And, you know, if you're an old person who is no longer able to get out of your own house, that's like a big, you're paying a big price for your not owning your health earlier in, in some cases. We have a list of, what looks to be, I don't know, eight or 10 factors that lead to happiness here. So we're going to knock some of these out, maybe in a not super rapid fashion, but Carl, do you want to kick us off and maybe get us into some of these? Yeah. So the first one was, I was thinking about the heat pump that we installed. What was that? A couple of summers ago? Yeah. And it, it was super hot. You remember when we did that? And and the thing was pretty heavy too. I'm, I'm pretty weak, but I think the, one of the parts was like 200 pounds. And we were doing this and I was covered. I had the nasty shirt on and I'm like, wow, we're both uh, well off financially. And uh, yeah, we're, we're doing this pretty strenuous work that like most people wouldn't sign on for. But it was gratifying too. Uh, where does work fit into happiness? Work is uh, for me, the big, one of the very biggest things. Like I'm only happy when I do a certain amount of work each day. It doesn't have to be a ton, but for me, it has a combination of like creativity and physical because I do physical work and it's often social too. I'm often working with close friends. So it all goes together. It doesn't really have a money component for me because most of my work, my carpentry work is unpaid, but all the other stuff is, is really there. And, you know, just the satisfaction of solving problems is I've just, to me, it's a really amazing recipe for happiness. And I'm, it's not for everybody. Like not everybody's driven to be a carpenter the whole life. But for me, that happens to be my soul craft. So it's really, it's sometimes I overindulge in it because it's so reliable that I have happy days that I'll just do like ridiculous amounts of carpentry. And then I have to remind myself, well, there's other things you should do in your life than just build, 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 build. <laughs> Cause it's like, it's maybe too easy. It's like a drug yeah. for me, but man, it's nice to know it works. Yeah. I found with myself, if we go like on a, on a vacation, like we are in Germany, I kind of if I don't have any work and sometimes like writing can be work for me, if I'm not doing that, I kind of go into a little mini depression. I don't like yeah. the, uh, not doing work. It right. Drives and that's me crazy, actually. a good problem to have. Yeah. I think like people who are truly not motivated to do stuff, I think their lives are sometimes missing, you know, missing this extra factor and they're, they're jealous of people who are driven to work. So I'm glad that we have the work. And for me, the ultimate vacation is one where you get to do work. That's why I have this idea of carpentourism, where you visit a friend who needs something built and who also wants to learn to build and then do a project together and stay with them for like several weeks. And then that's really the ultimate vacation for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before uh, we hit the next one, you were just showing us your latest project. Do you want to just tell us about it a little bit? Yeah, this is a good example. So... We're in my house right now and right underneath where I'm sitting is an area that used to be just a furnace room for this house, a lot of wasted space. And I have a lot of guests. The rest of the basement is already finished. So I decided to make a kitchen, kitchenette area out of this furnace room, which involved all kinds of fun, like optimizing the space and like plumbing and electrical work. And now it's getting almost done. And it's kind of unnecessary because it's gonna turn that area into a separate apartment, which I don't really need to rent out. But for me, it was just felt very satisfying because I was taking something that was wrong, which was my wasteful fur um, furnace and laundry room, and turning it into something that's right, which is like more living space down there. And the main beneficiary is just going to be like the series of guests that are always coming here to stay for a week. But, you know, I might rent it out someday too. And for me, it's just, I don't know, I've been obsessed with this project the last couple of weeks, like working on it from, you know, wake up until bedtime. 
And, uh, you know, you just got to go with the flow sometimes. If you feel like doing the work, then do it. Yeah, it's so neat. And I think I appreciated something you said down there. You're solving lots, lots of little puzzles. You're trying to figure out how to make the space most efficient as possible, how to fit certain things in certain places. And the construction itself is rewarding too. But figuring out all those little design aspects is, is pretty cool. I think it's yeah. uh, so neat and rewarding. Yeah, and it does play into the social and the other happiness stuff too, because it lets me have friends here more often. And it's also possible my son is going to use that apartment as his young adult, you know, hangout place, um, which I'm kind of encouraging him to do when he turns 18. So he can have some more, you know, have to get his own groceries and cook his own food and things like that. So, um, so it's not just for carpentry. It also plays into some bigger life goals of mine as well, which, you know, that, thinking about that as I build makes it more fun. If I was just building like, you know, an extra bar in a Donald Trump hotel or something, I wouldn't feel like, <laughs> you know, I'm contributing to society, <laughs> just creating some, you know, but this is for me, like it goes for my, my life goals. If Donald Trump called you and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous territory. Let's, uh, let's move on. I would be in a big rush to grab my recording. You know, I would want to make a recording of that phone call regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think autonomy is pretty important. I was listening to your interview and Tim Ferriss as well. And, and you said something like, uh, I'm outside shoveling snow, which is pretty relevant now because there's a lot of snow outside and it's super cold. And just knowing that I could, if I wanted to go online, book an Airbnb and go to a, a warm place, even though I'm not going to, but just knowing I could do that yeah. is a luxury in itself. Yeah, that's really true. Like being in a jail cell we would assume it's pretty unpleasant, but being in a bedroom that might be the same size, but it's your bedroom and you have the freedom to leave when you want, is like, is a great feeling. So yeah, I agree that autonomy, which is what one of the things that um, financial independence gives you so much of. I think that's why for a lot of us, it is an, it's almost like a mental crutch for feeling more free and happy because a lot of times we don't even use our extra money, but we just like to know that we have so many options. Yeah. I think that's why we enjoy the work too. Like if we had to do that heat pump for a boss and we had to be there at a certain time, it wouldn't be nearly as fun as it was Yeah, because we're choosing to do it. Yeah. And because we own it now and we get to see it as an ongoing science experiment and we're like, oh, I learned a lot of stuff like that from that project. And now I know how to install heat pumps and I know what size of one, you know, the details, if you're going to make it work in your own house. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. I've put too much on myself at some points in my life, including right now. And then it goes back to feel, feeling like a job, which isn't good. You don't want to cross that boundary because then what's the point of anything? You know, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, as long as you know there's an insight. Like I've overcommitted myself sometimes, even when retired. And, you know, the worst one was when I had a house building company that was like super stressful. And, it was, I was stuck in it for multiple years, despite wanting to end it. But then when I did finally get to that point, it's like, wow, did I ever feel happy? And it was a huge learning, um, a huge lesson I learned. And, and now I've been able to not commit to things. You know, I commit to things that I can handle and enjoy, but I don't commit to things that are going to be too much to, to have a balanced life. Was it hard to get to that point because i'm sure there's a lot of like fun opportunities so is it hard to say no sometimes not anymore uh now i maybe even say no too much but um it was a fun learning lesson uh and then what what happened is is once i started writing the blog the mr money mustache blog it brought so many more people into my life in terms of like emailing me and an invitations to go out into the world and do stuff like co-host these things in ecuador that carl has also co-hosted now our chautauquas mm -hmm and other other events and do some speaking events so they all sound fun especially if you've never done it before um but then you go out and you realize what what the benefits and the disadvantages of these things are so for a while i was just saying yes to everything like wow oh somebody wants to do a tv show with me and well who doesn't want to be on tv ha <laughs> like i was so naive and then i realized what that really entails and it's actually super horrible and boring so i learned to say no to things like that and yes to other things and it ends up boiling, boiling out to being just right. As long as you keep questioning yourself, like, am I doing too much or too little? And okay. Then, yeah. It's very nice right now. I feel like really nice balance. 
And I guess, you know, this is not on our list, but you were just in the Netflix documentary. What was that called? Get Smart with Money. So how, how was that? What made you say yes to that one? Um, so that was totally right on the list of things I wasn't going to do. And I have right on my website, like not interested in, <laughs> in this kind of stuff. So the filmmakers of that sent me an email saying, Hey, are you sure you don't want to be in a documentary? And I'm like, Oh, I'm super sure. Thank you for the offer though. But then they talked me into it because they're like really, really thoughtful, meaningful, you know, world changing type people the the filmmakers who make the, who own this company called Atlas films. So I looked at their other movies and I'm like, Oh, okay. I see what it's not just like a cheap, you know, CNN feature where they're just trying to get some eyeballs. These are like issue documentaries where they're trying to make a difference. And in this case, they're trying to help people get better with money, you know, middle-class Americans and different levels of income Americans. So there was a good mission behind it. So I said, yes. And then, and also they promised it wasn't going to be a lot of work because it was split among, I'm just like one of the coaches in this movie that's coaching people throughout the year, 2021. So in the end, it was, it was pretty great. Like, it still had the usual grind of filmmaking that I don't enjoy. Like you have to sometimes repeat conversations because, and so it gets a little bit fake and staged and um, little, little things like that, but just minor overall, the benefits were much greater than the costs to my mm-hmm. <laughs> free time of helping work on that. And did it bring like more people to the blog? I'm just curious, like yeah. the actual amount of publicity that it. Brings. It was like, I mean, it was moderately good, not as good as being on the Tim Ferriss podcast, just, but yeah. about, about half as good as being on that podcast, <laughs> just as an interesting comparison. Cause you do like, it's so much, it's a lower leverage activity. Cause you had to, we had to work for throughout 2021, I had to meet for like maybe 10 days of filming. And so that's like a lot of hours, maybe a hundred hours of work in total. Whereas going on the Tim Ferriss podcast is about three hours of work. Maybe you can add in an extra five hours because I read his latest book just so I would be brushed up on his mm-hmm. stuff. So 10 hours of work and like for this huge, you know, exposure to a bunch of people, which brought in a lot of new mustachians, which was huge, you know, for motivating for me. Um, so I'm still open, you know, like there was some selfish benefit to working on the movie just because I knew I would like to get my my writing out there some more. Mm-hmm. But it was, mo- it was mainly about, you know, the movie itself, hopefully reaching other people through its own message. That's kind of the real reason I did it. Cool. And then jumping over again, another topic that we weren't going to cover, but so you are on the Tim Ferriss show, right? It's the thread we keep talking about. (laughs) Like, did you read his books before or were you a big fan? Like, what was it like being on the show? Just like 10 questions, but yeah. What what do you think? Well, I was just peripherally follower of Tim Ferriss. Like, you know, I I don't listen to any podcasts. And since his stuff was mostly podcast, I was only a little bit aware of it. Um, And I was, everybody knew about like, you know, the four hour work week and the four hour body and this kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. some good ideas in there. Um, But I just hadn't gotten around to reading the books. So I did read the latest book that he had made. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was called, but. um, Probably four hour chef. Yeah, yeah, which was a, about a lot of stuff besides just that. Or, or maybe it's Tools of Titans had had come out before I went on that mm-hmm. interview. So I read that one as well. Anyway, it was cool. Uh, it was good to be caught up on it. Um, and then as as for the experience, it's just like going on any other podcast. Like you're just talking to a person and it usually ends up pretty nice. Like you get in a conversation, you don't even realize how much time is passing. And it was great. He, has, he asked great questions. He seemed to really get get the stuff. And it also led to, but the, the most remarkable part to me was just how many people the ideas struck. You know, I'm still hearing from people now, like including my own doctor, for example, that I am now <laughs> a subscriber to his direct care practice. Like I was sitting there at the patient, you know, interview where he's deciding if you can join the practice. And he's like, I just got to, you know, got to be transparent here. I, I'm a big fan of you uh, ever since the Tim Ferriss podcast. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's super weird <laughs> for your doctor to say that. But yeah, my doctor is like, you know, really in on health, you know, new developments. So he listens to all the medical podcasts, including Tim Ferriss, because he interviews doctors. Okay. So that was like, that was a, bu- a bunch of weird stuff like that has happened. Some that I can't even mention because it would be like revealing too much, but like just interesting connections out in the world that have come from that. So that's, wow. that was cool. That's amazing. Yeah. If he asked you to be on the show again, would you go? Yeah, of course. I mean, it was right. fun the first time. I'm sure it would be fun the second time. And yeah. We'll let Tim know then. 
<laughs> just kidding. We, we don't know. Okay, what's next, Carl, on here? Yeah, we've got a bunch. So we, I put a big list, and I don't know if you want to go into any of these in detail, but I've got stuff like exercise on here, which I think is very important, or uh, social friends, which we've talked a little bit about already, routine. Um, one you added, and also from Tim Ferriss, was removing negatives. Uh, maybe that one is worth talking about a little bit more. Yeah, right. That was a, a concept I had just kind of come up with, like from reading some summary of a study about it, psychological study. But when it comes to happiness, um, a lot of people think, especially if they're in a situation like us where their lives are pretty good already, we got it set up pretty well. So like, hey, maybe I should just do an upgrade. Like I'll get a nicer car or a nicer fridge or something. And usually that's a, that fails because you are, your fridge wasn't a problem or your car wasn't a problem. And you're trying to upgrade something that's already good enough. And that's a very fleeting kind of happiness. So what the researchers found is that finding something that consistently nags on you and like grinds your life down and then removing that from your life somehow is a much more reliable way to, to improve the happiness. So if you have like a stressful commute is a good example, you know, and you choose to get a different job or move somewhere where your commute is gone, then you've removed something bad from your life. And then it's like, that's a lasting kind of happiness because you're, you're not poisoning each single day mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, this is a nice way to flip exercise uh, on its back too. Cause like a lot of people do suffer from physical or health problems that are a re result of not being in exercising enough. So if you could start a program that allows you to remove these things, like what if you no longer had sore, sore knees or you no longer had sleep apnea or these other things that cause, that are caused by health problems, you can remove them by, by getting in better physical health. So a bunch of stuff like that. If you think about, especially if you're kind of mindful and you do journaling and just think about what are the negatives in your life, not to focus on them explicitly, but just to understand what is it that kind of bums me out about life right now? Mm -hmm. And then you focus your efforts on those things first. That's probably the most effective use of your time. And that, that actually helped me out a lot. I can't think of any specific examples, but I think um, it made me think twice about you know getting the new fridge or, or whatever. And I'm, I'm curious, do you have any examples from the years where you identified a negative, removed it, and you were like, wow, that that worked better than I thought. I mean, the biggest thing was that construction company that I mentioned mm -hmm. that I did own and it was really, really negative. And when it was gone, I was just like someone had let go of a, a helium balloon of my soul. And I suddenly I'm soaring up to the sky <laughs> like, wow, I didn't realize how much that was holding me down. Okay. So yeah, I think, I mean, I've been so relentless about that, that my life is embarrassingly free from negative things. So now it's at the stage where Anytime I'm in a bad mood or having a bad day, it really is just my own <laughs> suckiness. That's the result. Like there's just no reason for me to be anything other than elated at all times, which is kind of funny because then when I am having a bummer day, I'm like, you asshole, like how could you be unhappy even now? <laughs> but that also is a good working point because you're like, aha, yes, now I understand that humans, you know, we just fluctuate, our emotions fluctuate and your hormones fluctuate. I call it menstruation. You know, like sometimes I just get... <laughs> in a grumpy mood and I don't feel like doing the stuff that I know would make me feel good. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, but just getting out for a walk is usually my, my first step. Yeah. You know, make sure you're sleeping well and eating well and get out for a walk. And with my magic Andrew Huberman list that I have now, like in a little spreadsheet form mm -hmm. that's printed out, that kind of helps me a lot. Cause it's like the little, the tiny daily steps that pretty much can put you in a better mood if you're not in a good mood. Yeah. And speaking of walking, and I, I get in those little moods too, maybe, I, I think it's probably four to six weeks, maybe a day or two. I'm like, ah, oh, just lower motivation or whatever. But I try to, you know, get out and walk, like you said. And you you sent a message uh, yesterday and it was like, ah, I just went out for a walk. It was like negative 13 Fahrenheit yesterday. And you were like, mm -hmm. oh, I just went for a walk. And I was like, I'm going for, a, after you sent that, I went for a walk. Oh, and I was yeah. like, it's great. Right on. Yeah. High five, yeah. man. It was cold as shit, and uh, that was a weird high five, but we'll, we'll fix <laughs> we'll it later. edit that out. Yeah, we'll make it <laughs> the, yeah so it was uh, not, not miserable. You know, you just bundle up. But yeah, yeah. The, the sun and the cold and like, you know, yeah. no one else was out. It makes you feel kind of cool like you're doing something like Yeah, we were amazing. Cool. The weird part is, physiologically, 
um, going for a walk in the extreme cold is is similar to taking an ice bath. Like it's really, really likely, especially if it was sunny, which it was yesterday and today. Um, it's just like all this stuff just gets your hormones and your adrenaline. So you usually feel amazing if you just go out and like shovel snow or walk in the snow. The colder, the better. So in a way that helps me get through these weird times where like Colorado is normally 50 degrees and suddenly it's minus 10. Um, you can actually have a better day despite the weather being you yeah. know, infuriatingly cold. It was a little chilly. Did you get out yesterday? Um, no, I was uh, redoing my floor. I walked back and forth to our project house, but I didn't intentionally go on a walk, which I like to do every day, and I did not do it yesterday. It was because of lack of time. Not well, you went back and forth to the house. That counts. Yeah, yeah you still have to expose yourself to the cold. Yeah. It's, it, it's not quite the same. It, I didn't. I usually go for a walk around our neighborhood. It's like a yeah. two-mile loop, and I did oh, not nice. have a chance to do that. Cut, cut through the golf course if anyone from the golf course is listening. Uh, don't don't report me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that is a tip for listeners. You know, the, especially with winter just kind of getting started, is if you have any problems in your life, uh, you could start by addressing them by adding a winter walking schedule. Especially if you live somewhere that's cold and you're probably on protest, you're on strike for the season. I would tell people to like reverse that stance and really start doing serious walks outside. Just put on the right clothes for it. And it can be an amazing. It's seriously like taking a small serving of cocaine uh, in terms of how much it elevates your mood and motivation just to get out in the cold. So we, w- we went over several things. There's other factors that lead to happiness. How does all that fit into FIRE? Well, FIRE, financial independence and retiring, retiring early is just a shortcut that gives you more free time to do these other things. So you don't have to be retired, of course, to get better at happiness and health. It just happens to be like, if you're a person like me who doesn't like having all of your time booked up by other people's agendas, which is what happens if you have a job, especially if you have a really busy job, then, um, you know, getting the freedom to quit that job is a pretty big boost in terms of the free time. But you really, you know, kind of almost have to put these two things as separate or maybe even as three things. So like there's money. So if you have, if you're stressed about money because you have debt and you're, you feel like you're out of control, then you can fix that immediately separately from retiring. You know, you just get better at understanding your spending and becoming more efficient with your spending, maybe increase your income, but that's sort of like a secondary thing. Most important is your spending. That's prong number one. Prong number two is if you get good enough at this for a long enough time, then you don't have to work anymore. So you could quit your job if you want, or you can work less, or you can switch to an industry where it's purely aligned with what you enjoy doing. And then the third thing is this happiness and self-improvement and self-study. So I like to do all of them, but um, anybody can get benefits from any of the three. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking when I first stopped working, I was probably actually a little bit more unhappy than happy. And it was because I didn't have a job. So all these problems that I had been ignoring or like suppressing because I didn't have the time bubbled up to the surface and I had to deal with them. But in the end, that's good because these things probably would have had some kind of subconscious negative effect on me, maybe a long-term effect and liberating myself from my job, gave me the time to work through those things and and deal with them, which is great. I think uh, J.D. Roth once said something like, if you want to see who you really are, like quit your job and give yourself the time or something like that, which I think is great because, uh, yeah, what are you like? I, you're awake uh, for 16 hours a day approximately. So what does that come out to per week? Like 112 hours per week. And if you're working and have a commute, that's like half of your waking hours are devoted to someone else. And you're not going to have a lot of time to deal with a lot of your own stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh I think it's, I remember a reading on your blog that you and you and Mindy, your wife had um, admitted that once you had more free time together, you, you realized like, huh, we have to work on our relationship because now that the job thing's been taken out of the way, we realize like we're kind of pissing each other off. You know? Yeah. Or <laughs> Something you, like that. Yeah, <laughs> it, that's true. Or you use your job as a, as a crutch like, oh, it's just, I would deal with this, but I've got the job, so I'm not going to. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's much healthier to... Uh, <laughs> deal with your stuff instead of making excuses to not deal with it. Yeah. Right. And I think that that was cool that you admitted that in a public forum. And I think it's probably helpful to remind other people to just not use your job as an excuse to, to do 
to yeah. skip the hard work of life and improving in, on these things. Yeah, it's such a luxury. It's so so thankful to have the time to, uh, if once you're free from your job, you've got the time to become the best example of yourself that you can be, the time yeah. to work out and everything else, which is so good. Yeah, it's remarkable. Like having been in it for, retired for like 17 or 18 years now, so that's like much longer than my actual career was. So it's become normal and I've almost forgotten how nice and luxurious it is. But I think it really slows down your aging and your, you know, because you're not under stress and stress is a big cause of aging. And if you happen to have the health as a hobby and you can apply more time to doing things right for yourself, um, it's almost like an, an immortality, not immortality, but like a fountain of youth yeah. um, thing. And I, I like that. I didn't know that was one of the effects when I quit working at 30, but now I'm more and more thankful for that because yeah, just having time to work on things. Yeah. I remember I was in uh, high school and we always had to do pull-ups every year. And uh, I think I was like 16 or something. And I never did more than one at any time before I was like 37 and retired. But I remember in high school, I struggling and I, I could always do one and then that'd be it. I'd fail. And I remember I did my one, I let myself off the bar and I turned around in this, uh, Pretty girl who I had a crush on is like laughing at me. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but now, like I did 11, I'm 49 years old. I just turned 49 and I did 11 pull-ups and I'm not, I know I could do a lot more than that. I haven't really been working that hard yeah. yet. So here I am, like who knows how could it, how good I could have been back then. Yeah. But but now I've got the time, so I'm not complaining. Yeah. I'm so thankful that I could still work hard and I've got the time to do that now. It pays off to be a late bloomer because we can keep getting better and better now because we weren't particularly awesome when we were young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I'm still yeah. occasionally will set a new weightlifting record, even though I'm 48 as well. And I think that's good because you're supposed to be getting weaker at this age, but instead I'm I'm just getting the nutrition and the exercise stuff a little bit better, pretty casually. I'm not like hardcore in any way, but it really feels nice to be like, yeah, almost 50 year old guy. Yeah. Stronger than he was at 21. So I want to take a quick side diversion. None of this is on here, but we talked a little bit about this before. Probably the thing I appreciate most about the Mr. Money Mustache blog is you don't you don't seem to accept, well, you do accept good wisdom, but you're quick to reject other things too. I'm trying to think of a specific example, like some of the stuff you've done in your house, like using the water heater to make a heating system for your floor, like a fraction of the price of buying a boiler. And when you did your shed, you went out and, and I was there for this. I helped you uh, move the concrete, which is a pretty physically difficult day. So <laughs> oh yeah, uh, my favorite part of it is just not, except maybe that's too strong of a word, but maybe questioning common wisdom. Like why can't you set a new weightlifting record when you're 49 or 48 or whatever? Where yeah. does that mentality come from and how does that benefit you? Um, it, well, in a way it was just how I was born. Like I feel like I've always been a rule. I didn't really like rules. And to me, they seemed irrational. I think if you were to be a neurologist and you could look at my, the way I'm different is probably that I'm missing certain genes that that cause me to want to follow in a social norms. So that can be bad, you know. Like I can I can be a weirdo, or I can sometimes miss understand what's appropriate to do in you know in a social situation. Uh, so that's the downside. But then the upside is that I can, you know, when when the new rules come down from on high, I can be like, wait a minute, that's bullshit. Like I'm not gonna pay attention to that. But most of the time, the rules do make sense. Like you understand, for example, why they speed limits and why you're not allowed to hurt other humans and why you shouldn't pollute. So it's not like I reject rules outright for no reason. I just think about each rule as it comes in and then try to decide like, what's the basis of this rule and should I obey it or not? And yeah, when it comes to handyman work, like, you know, the, the whole thing where it's like, can consult a qualified professional before you even change a light fixture in your house or something, then it's easy to ignore those rules. Or like retiring early, I guess, mm -hmm. is the usual example is why should I wait till 65 to retire? If it, if it only takes a certain amount of money, why don't we just get to that amount of money earlier? Yeah, it's a fine line. Uh, a lot of common sense is kind of bullshit, like the whole food pyramid thing, which I think still haven't updated for when I was a kid, it was, oh, yeah. you should eat a lot of carbs and not fat. And well, look at that. That was wrong. So, but it's a fine yeah. line. You don't want to delve into uh, conspiracy theory stuff either. But I think just seeking out smart people who have done the research and have the data, like that's how you 
figure out if they're really full of shit or they're not, or if it has. Yeah. Right. And for me, I usually focus on areas that I, I understand myself. So I'm not depending on other people like building a house, obviously that's pretty simple. So I understand that I don't have to check if something's okay or not with a professional, like I'll know if, it, if it'll work. Uh, medicine and health, I'm not so well versed in. So I do have to kind of depend on other people or like expect, you know, research papers, but some things, you know, like numbers and math and money that's really easy to check you know you just need a spreadsheet to know if something's true or not so it's quite easy to defy the financial norms in that department and you know physics and and math things as well like trying to decide for example how to set up your house or how to how to use your car or how not to use your car that's all just like plain old engineering stuff so that that lets me feel like pretty confident if i'm going to do something different don't get us back on track. Yeah. This is kind of an open-ended question, so you can take it however you want. What do you struggle with? I, I was supposed to be prepared for this question. Hmm. We can come back to it also. <laughs> I think I have an answer. I think I have an answer. Um, I struggle with a lot of times knowing what the right thing to do is and still not doing it. Like just having bad habits and thinking... I'll do, I just don't feel like doing the right thing because it's too hard. So I'm going to do an easy thing instead. Mm -hmm. Do you have, can you give us an example of that if, if it's possible? Yeah. Like one of them is working on my blog. Like I don't write as much as I know would be good mm -hmm. for me. Cause I really enjoy when I, the writing process and I enjoy finishing an article and getting it out there and I enjoy the response that comes back from the world, but it's really hard. You know, you have to think and focus and, and every time is like a leap of faith because you're presenting your work to the world and then some people are going to come and attack it and criticize. So it's like an emotional boundary to get over each time. So I tend to be like, I'm just going to build some more stuff in my house or, you know, like do the easy things instead. And um, similarly, like making appointments, making plans is hard for me. So making plans with friends usually leads to really good experiences, but it's also something I don't do all that much mm -hmm. because it's easier not to sometimes <laughs> it's easier to just wake up and have a great breakfast and then decide what I'm going to do that day. And that's mm -hmm. like still how I mostly want to lead my life. But if I do that 100% of the time, then I'm not going to have any friends to hang out with. Mm -hmm. So there's little things like that. Very, um, very simple struggles, but they still seem to haunt me sometimes. Yeah. How much would you, publish on the blog if you didn't have that issue? I think the perfect amount for the stage right now is it would probably be about one post every two weeks. Cause I don't want to flood people, you know, like the, the goal with anything I do with my writing, like whether it's running the Twitter account for that blog or the Instagram account or the blog is like every follower, if they want to, should be able to read all the stuff and not have it be a big deal. Like it shouldn't be dominating their life or I don't want people to open up their thing like, Oh geez, another Mr. Money mustache article. I haven't even read the last one. There's too much like, mm. and it, cause it just feels like sort of like on Christmas morning, even if you like the presents, if you get too much, you're just not even going to be excited about them. So keeping it sparse is nice. So two, once every two weeks mm -hmm. would be amazing for me. 26 articles per year. That would keep it really, engaging and it would still give me time to do everything else I like in life. Mm -hmm. And like, how much do you want to do that? Like, what do you, are, is it a goal for next year or is it just like, eh, theoretically in this thought experiment that we're having right now, just, well, I felt that was the right amount for a long time, but I just don't seem yeah. to produce that much. Okay. And it's cause I'm not, I obviously don't want it enough to do it. Yeah. So the answer is not enough. And then the other thing is I also have a YouTube channel which my son and I started a while ago and we did some videos together. There's about 11 on there. And then we kind of stopped because we both got on our other projects, but that was really, really fun. Like, and now he's a million times better at video creation and editing and animation than he was back then. Even, even then I thought he was really good. So it'd be super joyful to do more stuff with him right now. And it's like father and son bonding. Like if we do stuff right now, we're going to laugh about it when he's 40 years old and, yeah. and, and celebrate it. So that's probably even more important than my writing is I should do more co-creation with my son, I think, while the window is still open. Mm -hmm. 
And I was going to say this space is great to shoot in. I know you guys could do stuff all over the place, but yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a nice. We don't even have to leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And we have all the equipment too, because he does a lot of video stuff already. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, just a matter of setting it up and, and doing some more videos. And we have tons of ideas too. So I don't know. I'd say like, mm -hmm. and you're probably helping me make this resolution, but I'm going to put more of my effort into that for, for 2023. <laughs> I yeah, we, have, here. <laughs> we have it on video we have proof here so yeah. and then the other and I'm, I'm i'm gonna we'll move on i just have one more follow-up so you were like uh yeah. this the second part is you don't make plans as much so where does that come from it sounds like you know the freedom of the day you wake up and it's like what is the world presenting me with and then what yeah. do we do and soon i i we're working together to play some music together so we're gonna have a, a bad jam session or something like that. So we'll have to plan, but I'm curious, what's yeah. the, what's the hang up there? Um, if I do it too much, then I don't have a very happy life because I wake up, I'm like, ah, oh, why did I make these plans today? I want to do this thing, but I have okay. planned this other thing. So I need to keep enough open space to do these joyful days of personal creativity. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of finding the right amount. And I, I tend to do too little. So, I mean, for me, having one planned thing per week would be fine. You know, like a hike mm -hmm. with the guys, music night with the guys, this type of stuff is perfect for me. And mm -hmm. then the rest of my life just naturally fills in because there is lots of people and activities that are already here, right here at home. So I feel yeah. like very nice and connected already. But, yeah. you know, and I should have a, yeah, as Carl and I resolved, we have to get a headquarters, like get to the headquarters together. Ideally, once a week would be nice. Yeah. And that would be pretty nice. You yeah. Add that with the add, and then add in a hike or like mountain biking day, and then okay. you know occasional other things like that, and then that would be a pretty nice balance. Yeah, and it, I understand a hundred percent. I know I don't I don't say yes to way too many things, but maybe one or two. So when something gets canceled, I think it's great. If someone's like, oh, I can't make that meeting or whatever, yeah. I'm like. I have a free whatever half a day or whatever the thing was. So I, I get it. I yeah. Understand. Right. I'm just maybe more sensitive than others to the overscheduling. And I love, I just love free time. And that's why I'm retired in the first place. So <laughs> got to keep that, that natural vibe somewhat intact. Yeah. Uh, Geez, I've got a typo on here. I wrote involuntary hardship, which is actually pretty bad. So <laughs> it should have said voluntary hardship yeah. on the uh, little outline I wrote here. And this is probably one of the other favorite thing I've learned from the Mr. Money Mustache blog. Can you explain what that is and why that's so valuable to have in your life? Yeah, well, it's certainly not a concept that I invented, but it turns out it's a principle of stoicism and other philosophies that um, if you choose to do difficult things, then your life will be better. And the secret is just, there's all kinds of things that happen when you do this. So for example, choosing to go for a walk in cold weather is a really good, easy to understand example of voluntary hardship because you do have to get dressed up warm. You do have to experience cold and your body's gonna be working harder. But in exchange, you end up feeling great because of it. And similarly, if you do um, take on some of the projects around your own house, like cut your own grass or if, if you get the skills and do your own renovations, it's obviously hard. It's a lot harder than just watching stuff on Netflix, but because you're choosing to do it and you put yourself through this challenge, the rewards, like you, you tend to be extremely happy because of that. Like even while you're doing it, even though it's hard, you tend to be happy. And then afterwards you get this lifelong satisfaction of, Hey, I did that hard thing. So people tend to, be programmed right now in our society to avoid anything hard. Like the, the ultimate example is just the, the very existence of escalators and elevators. <laughs> like they're everywhere and everybody uses them. Even if they're like 25 years old, there are people that like get off the airplane and come down through the train and then they just stand perfectly still <laughs> on this escalator that's moving incredibly slow. And like that guy can walk. Like, why is he using this thing? And it's so backwards. Like, nobody should be on the escalator if they still are blessed with legs that are good enough to use stairs. Otherwise you're not going to have those legs anymore. So like that is maybe that's the best example is like always take the fucking stairs because it's a blessing that you can take the stairs and that's voluntary hardship yeah. at its core. I think of that all the time too. How happy would the guy or a girl in a wheelchair be to walk up the stairs another time in their life? Like it'd just be magical for them and we'll right. take it for granted. And, uh, 
Yeah. I think about this relative to like things I've done, uh, exercise and public speaking. They're both difficult and hard and they both suck and give you, well, public <laughs> speaking, anxiety, it's still hard. Weightlifting and all that stuff sucks. Like you got to go to the gym, stress yourself if you want to improve. But that's where all your growth happens when you put yourself through some shit. Yeah. And the neat part is after you get over the hump of uh, resistance to these things, you end up wanting to do them. Like they are self-sustaining. Like people who exercise regularly, they're not doing it because they're dragging themselves to the gym. They're doing it because they're drawn to the gym or to the running shoes or whatever. And, and that's really the ultimate is when you can get that thing set up where you actually crave to do hard things mm -hmm. because that's, uh, it's self-sustaining. It's a recipe for a very happy life and have much longer and healthier life too. So I do mostly hard stuff, but it's mostly me enjoying, it's, it's the things that I want to do and, and I'm drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And I have sort of a follow-up question and maybe you kind of answered it there, but as humans, we adapt pretty well to whatever the norm is. So have you had to change your voluntary hardships over time because you got used to it? Or have you just, now you're, um, now, now you like it. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I still like it. So there's nothing about it that, you know, the formula for happiness that requires it to be unpleasant. Mm -hmm. It just has to be challenging. So it's, if it's pleasant, that's kind of good. I mean, there's also a whole separate thing in psychology of facing your fears and how action cures fear. And that is probably something that I still am not very good at. I haven't really, I don't get many chances to have something scary and then push through the challenge and then do it because my life is too much convenience right now. So if anything, I, I should work on that. Mm -hmm. But the basic hardships, like just plain old physical hardships or, or mental complexities are, is already there. And I'm, I'm grateful for it because it is definitely making me feel good about it. You mentioned that you did some speaking on like bigger stages and stuff. Did you, uh, like go through a lot of anxiety. Are you a good public speaker? How, how'd it go with that? that yeah. Angle? Much like Carl, um, going through that journey, I w I found it really stressful to try to do a prepared talk. So I only did it once and it, I did, I followed the guy, one guy's advice of to like really, really prepare like for months in advance and practice and stuff. And I just found that so unpleasant. Like, so the experience of being on the stage and delivering the talk was awesome super nice. I always like being in, in public and talking to people like groups, if it's small or large, it's totally fine. But for me, the whole idea of trying to memorize something and practice it is horrible. Like, and having to think in advance, like, am I going to screw it up? I know you can get good at that, but I'm not interested in getting good at that. I would rather just do whatever. Yeah. Um, extemporaneous like a is the word, like just yeah. off the cuff speaking. Yeah. Um, and, and as long as, you know, it's a venue where that's acceptable and they're mm -hmm. not expecting a polished talk, then that's good enough for me. So a panel is perfect for you, right? Well, a panel is kind of cheating because then you're just asking each other questions. Yeah. And I mean, that is cool. But I also don't mind, you know, like going and giving a talk to someone who really wants to learn, a group that really wants to learn something, you know, and I could just go up and be like, explain early retirement or explain... 4% rule or how to build a kitchen or something. If it's something that I know about, mm -hmm. then I can give a talk without having to prepare like slides and stuff. And I think that's, you know, it's not a super winner uh, answer. Like, I think I really admire people who give like great talks. Alan Donegan, Alan and Katie Donegan are some people like that yep. as an example are really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. But right now that's not one of my goals that I'm willing to do the hard work to get good at. Yeah. And just for this audience, your big talk was the World Domination Summit, and I think they can watch that online, correct? On my, yeah, my yeah. YouTube okay. channel. We'll put a link <laughs> to your YouTube. So still on the topic of voluntary hardship, have you caved on anything where you are taking the easier route instead of taking the harder one? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I think sometimes, like sometimes out of personal weakness, like I'm, like I know this is the right thing to do, Maybe a good example of that is running. Like, so I, it's easy for me to go for morning walk, but it's hard for me to commit to like actually running multiple miles. So I end up just walking instead, even though I know that running is better for me. And sometimes I'll throw in like little bits of running and stuff. But for some reason, that's a hurdle I've still not gotten over. And it's strange because I, 
you know, because physical stuff is so important to me. So I'm surprised. It's it's a psychological weirdness. <laughs> maybe next time I get to interview with you, I'll have it figured out, or maybe yeah. not. So that's like an example of losing. And then there's a maybe like a more deliberate example is uh, is like I used to try to be frugal of going to the airport when I was younger because it's like in Longmont, it's not close to the Denver airport, so there's no city bus. You have a choice of either like driving and parking in a horrible cheap parking lot and taking a shuttle or driving and then you know taking parking the expensive parking lot that's nicer or to take an uber and you know all different combinations different costs and usually like the more convenient stuff is the more expensive so over time as i was going to the airport more for some of my recent life which has involved more travel I was just like, I'm just going to take the most convenient way and take Ubers directly there. Because when I thought about the money I was saving for doing these other things versus the time and how much I hated it, I'm mm. like, I'm just going to, it's totally worth, in this case, it was like $75 each way to take an Uber. And, um, it, you know, for a frugal person, it, it's hard to let yourself spend $75, believe it or not. But once I really worked it out, I'm like, you know, it's, you're never going to wish you had an extra $150. You know, even if I travel 10 times a year, Mm -hmm. It's like $1,500. Like some people spend that much per month on restaurants. You know, I would use justifications like that to be like, okay, you know what? Take the Uber to the airport. And it's also, it's, the alternative is not free. I mean, the cheapest way to get to the airport is $40. So really I'm only making a difference of $35 yeah. per time. So once I, you know, talk myself into it like that, then I just let myself do the easy thing because it makes travel. It's back to this earlier concept that you asked me about which is removing a negative. And for me, that just getting to and from the Denver airport from where we live is a huge negative, whereas the rest of your trip is quite fun. So if I can pay a bit of extra money to get rid of that negative and remove it, then suddenly I enjoy traveling again. Mm -hmm. nice. So I try to do that, actually. That's one of the things, and I'm trying to train other people who are maybe also too frugal, and they've already made it financially. Sometimes our habits come with us even when they don't need to anymore. So remind yourself like, Hey, you can spend more money now. So is there anything that spending more money on would, would be improving your life? Mm -hmm. And if so, then try it, like allow yourself to spend it and you might actually end up with a better life, uh, spending more. And that, um, it's a concept Brandon, the mad scientist mentioned where we treat $20 like we did when we were in college, where it was like a lot yeah. of money and we mm -hmm. treat $20 the same way now. And really it should be like, $1,500 or something if you like yeah. linearly apply it to your net worth. So. Absolutely. It's a really good way to, to challenge yourself and not get upset. Like say you're in Hawaii and you want to buy, you know, like a package of, of cheese that you would expect to be $4 here on the mainland. And it's like $12. The frugal person's like, ah, I can't pay $12 for this tiny block of cheese. That's ridiculous. Instead, you just like, you know what? And that's why I phrase it a certain way. I always think, okay, if you look at your net worth and there's $12 missing, are you going to care? Or even if you multiply it across like a year of buying cheese in Hawaii, like if you're missing $1,200, are you going to be like, darn it, I'd be happier if I just had $1,200 more. And the answer is no, right? If you really do have good savings, then these numbers that are in the hundreds or the thousands mm -hmm. aren't a big deal. So if it's going to let you be happier to chill out about those things, then it's a really good exercise to force yourself to do it. Before I send it to Carl, what kind of cheese are you picturing in your mind right now? It sounds like maybe this happened to you, Pete. So what, what kind of, what's your go-to cheese? Um, I can't even remember the name, but there's like a really strong cheese that's like in, infused with whiskey, mm. you know, and it's like, it's like similar to an extra sharp cheddar, but in a more exotic variety of cheese. Okay. And uh, it, this didn't literally happen in Hawaii, but it happened with all the other grocery prices when I was living there one winter. Yeah. I just remember being shocked that things were sometimes literally five times as much as you expected. And then uh, I had to train myself to not worry. And, you know, and also, you know, I was living with some people who were also mustachians. So he's like, oh, yeah, we'll just get it on the military base because this guy was a military mm -hmm. officer and they have like a subsidized grocery store there. So a combination of workarounds and just not worrying about it helped me learn how to live in more expensive places. Curb that cheese habit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, or you could just pick free avocados off the trees, which we also did. Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the joys of having money is liberating yourself from worrying about those small decisions. And uh, a lot of those small things 
Uh, like I try to think of something I could buy that could make me happy, and there's not that. Like I try to think of big stuff. I already tried the expensive car that didn't make me happy. Our house is fine. But it's it comes down to the little things that don't matter so much, which is good, right? Like yeah. the fact that we don't have to think about cheese or I bought a $14 beer at the airport, which, see, the fact that I still remember this and talk about it years yeah. later, Doug and I have had this conversation. <laughs> but I, I should just let it go. But even buying it in the first place was me letting it go. And it was nice. It was yeah. the ocean beach. Like we're sitting outside. The airport had this outdoor area. It was beautiful. Like I'm thankful I got to buy that $14 beer. Yeah. Yeah. If you flip it on its head and you think it's amazing that and i acknowledge that it is wasting money you know i'm throwing away 13 of that 14 dollars because beer should be one dollar but uh the fact that i can throw away that much money is nice and i apply that to burritos for me when i'm traveling i'll just I, burritos kind of my favorite travel food and i just mm -hmm. allow myself to buy any burrito anywhere including for the people i'm with i'm willing to buy them burritos too <laughs> and that's how i think about life and financial independence in a nutshell in a burrito shell do you have a favorite burrito place here in longmont or a favorite burrito um we have a lot of local places that i don't remember the names of because they're mm -hmm. like family run mm -hmm. um but out of the ones that i remember the names of i love jefe's oh yeah mm. jefe's is really good food and and then out of the national chain um i'm still like chipotle it's quite reliable mm -hmm. good burrito that you can get even in like florida and places where you normally wouldn't expect it yeah cool yeah okay let's move on um yeah one thing i thought about lately is i used to make all these goals for myself and i the conclusion i came to is it's a pretty toxic way to live actually maybe that's too strong of a way to put it but you, you make this goal you reach it and it's kind of anticlimactic it f makes your mind focus on that future time which isn't good it takes you out of the present and then it's not so great once you actually reach it. so one thing i think about now is the journey is a lot more important. Like instead of making a goal to do X number of pull-ups, maybe my goal should just be to go to the health club on it or do my exercise routine on a regular basis. Yeah. What do you think about that? That's, I mean, when you were starting the question, I was hoping that was going to be my answer, but you already answered it. It's like, don't think about goals. Think about process by which you'd reach your goals and then make that your goal. So you make a plan to have a daily thing that you do it moves you a little bit towards it. And then that's a lot easier to achieve too, because you're just doing one thing, but it also is what leads to results too. Because you can't just say like, I want to win the Olympics. You know, you have to say, I want to have a daily training practice that gets me further ahead. Yeah, cool. And I was chatting with uh, our friend JD Roth the other day and it, you know, kind of, paraphrase what you were what you were saying as well pete and it's you know systems versus goals and one problem with the, the goal is if you're marching towards it the whole time like you're failing and then you might not reach it it's very binary and then once you yeah. get to that goal then you then what you have to set another goal and keep yeah know, chasing that uh, cheese in this case but <laughs> But yeah, if you can flip it onto the system or the habits or whatever, then it's like you have a daily exercise habit or like weekly or whatever, whatever makes sense. But then it takes the pressure off and you can enjoy like the, you know, the, the struggle, um, have like meaningful struggles to, you know, do more pull-ups and like, you'll probably be able to do more pull-ups even though like you reverse engineered your, your goal car. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and it has to be something that's enjoyable because otherwise when you get to the goal and then you're, it's gone, it's like finishing a novel and you're like, oh, I'm sad that my novel's gone. It's like, imagine it would be foolish to have a goal of finishing a book that you really enjoy because you enjoy the process of reading it. Well, that should be the, true, the truth for all of our, our endeavors. It should be stuff that's sustainable for a whole lifetime. In fact, I had the funniest example. I was like, I met an, a new person recently and he said, I'm going to uh, get on a, I'm going to really get in shape starting in like mid January. Cause it's after this party and after this party and after this trip and this and that, and he's like, I'm really not happy with my fitness right now. I'm like, Holy shit. That's so backwards. Like you have to start today. Like you can't set a future goal where you're going to start something. Like you just have to start living that way today. And like, how about when you go to the party, you eat responsibly and drink responsibly. And that's cause fitness is only a lifestyle fitness is not a diet or a mm -hmm. you know something that you do and then you finish it so anyway it's yeah. weird to 
weird to make things like have start and end points. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to skip my next question. We already went over that a little bit. Um, yeah. Is there anything you changed about the journey? This is pretty open-ended and maybe a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to tell me to chuck it. Uh, no, I'm really, I probably would, you know, everything that happened in, at least in my own life, I felt like it probably had to happen in order for me to learn from it. And of course, I, if I took my current knowledge and went back, I would surely do some, some things differently, but I don't really have regrets over it. So I think it was good. Okay. It takes, it takes a lot of weird hardships and, and knocks to help you learn. And I'm sure I have a lot more still coming at me that I don't even know what's going to hit me, but it's, that's all, that's kind of the whole point of this. Yeah, well, I appreciate that you're a free thinker because I'm not. I was listening to the uh, your Tim Ferriss interview again, and you said when you accumulated enough money, you and the wife at the time just decided, hey, we've got enough, let's quit and have a child. That seems like what we should do. And uh, the thought of early retirement never occurred to me until I didn't like my job, and I Googled it. I already had pretty good savings, so and a thought I frequently think about is what happens, what would have happened if I didn't discover Mr. Money Mustache? Would this novel thought ever had entered my ever have entered my brain like how much longer would have I worked or how much would I have accumulated when I be one of those people mm -hmm. who died with like a crazy eight figure net worth but still worked till I'm like 65 or some shit like that so yeah that's an interesting thought and it is true that people who aren't part of our fire movement now they really don't many of them do have enough to retire or they soon will and they might not ever realize it which is funny I wonder though what is it that we're missing there's probably some other like free thinker things that we're just running along like rats in a maze and, and realize, you know, <laughs> our minds are yet to be open to these other useful ideas. There's some 13 year old now with a YouTube channel that'll blow our minds in the next six yeah. months. You should yeah. be doing this. I do hope to find out about, you know, all the good ideas. I want all of them. Yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I think you, I hope you're not completely right, but I know when I look back, uh, when I was 25 or whatever, and then 30 and then 35 and like 40 and I'm 43 now. And I'm like, oh, it was so stupid back then, but I thought I had everything figured out. And I'm yeah. like, it keeps moving forward. So I'm pretty sure right now I'm going to look back when I'm 50 and yeah. think, man, I was a fucking idiot. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's good to know that we're still stupid. <laughs> I don't know. We could be missing something. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up here, there's a question we like to ask. What does your perfect day look like? Hmm. My perfect day is, is also the same as my typical day. So it's pretty, pretty boring, but it's get up, observe the sunlight with my eyes as soon as possible after waking up, go for a morning walk, look at the birds and the forest and the, and the creek, and then come in and have a nice super strong coffee and write, write out in the day's journal and the day's plan. And then do some work in the morning and hang out with some friends at some point in the day, get some serious exercise at some point in the day, build something cool, and then have something entertaining at night, you know, like some reading or some movie, movie night or whatever. And then get a nice early bedtime with lots of super deep log-like sleep. And then just pretty much repeat that, but with different variations, like, you know, different friends, or sometimes you might be out on a trip or you might be at a campsite or you might be, working on a project with friends, you know, often in Hawaii or whatever. Same basic ingredients though, like healthy habits and work and friends are kind of the part of every perfect day for me. That's awesome. Well, Pete, this has been amazing. Thanks for joining us today. Where should people find you? Um, on the Mile High <laughs> Five <laughs> podcast. <laughs> this and or the other episodes. MrMoneyMustache.com. Yeah. We'll link up. And yeah, you were on, uh, we tried to spoof this uh, wild or hot one show where we ate like spicy things. Oh yeah. So uh -huh. we'll link up to that if people want to see kind of a sillier episode. We just kind of bullshit the whole time. That's true. It was good. Good eating that day, I recall. Thanks again. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington the balder host and carl jensen is the cool sexy one if you dig the show please do three things for us number one tell a friend a family member 
an enemy about the show, we really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. Here's a scenario. You're at a job interview. You could pick whatever, maybe it's IT related. And I think this will be great because you probably haven't done a job interview in a while, right? When was the last yeah. time? Yeah. Uh, 1999. Was that that's your first <laughs> Oh, wait, job? no, year 2000. That was my final job interview. Okay. Are you a good <laughs> interviewer? I used to get all the jobs that I interviewed for. I guess so. Okay, Carl, do you have an opening question for this mock interview? I'm going to use the question that I hated being asked most. I would always make up stuff when asked this question. Where do you, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, I hope to be retired from this job. <laughs> but I guess I wouldn't say that. I would be lying, right? You're supposed to lie if you're actually going to retire soon. Um, I would say I see myself as a a productive and expert member of this team, um, making contributions and encouraging people to have a, a nice work-life balance where they're highly effective, but also very healthy at the same time. Nice. I, I, I can see why you got all your <laughs> job offers that you interviewed for. <laughs> What's your greatest weakness? Um, hmm. I'm going to tell the truth for this one and which would prevent me from getting jobs. But my greatest weakness is that I tend to lose focus and then chase after the next fun project and then the next fun project. And maybe I ignore some of the hard stuff and I don't do the hard things as much as I should. Very deep. <laughs> we, we appreciate your honesty. Yeah. And we'll, we'll wrap up with one more. What's your greatest strength? Didn't you already ask me that? Or no, maybe it was the other. Was it weak? Did I ask weakness no, or that strength? Was, no, yeah, I see you asked for like five years from now. My greatest strength <laughs> is perhaps my ability to see the bigger picture and not be too zoomed in on, you know, like the details of one project. And instead I would say, well, why are we doing this project in the first place? Why don't we do it this other way or this entirely different project? And by not being afraid to say that to you as my boss, I think I could help us prevent some embarrassing and expensive mistake mistakes for this this corporation you you've applied that to your whole life like that's one of the things i love about mr money mustache you question everything and just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean you have to continue to do it that way like yeah mm -hmm. although when i tried that trick as like a 20 26 year old like pretty new engineer i did almost get fired for it because you know, I didn't like what, how my boss was running our division. And then I count, I was like, hey, what about if we do this other way? The engineers all kind of agree. And he's like, no. So I went over to his boss, like the director, and I was like, John's not really doing things the way that everybody thinks he should. And, and then John found out, and then he tried to get me fired. <laughs> but luckily, it, it, it backfired because, you know, like we ended up doing things the good way. And then John was kind of like, shuffled off to managing a smaller group. So I got away with it that time, but I could have just as easily been fired nice. for my precocious, you know, thinking I was smarter than, than I probably should have thought. Well, we said this was a mock interview, Yeah, but we have good news. We actually have a position open. It's an internship, but I think you're kind of a good fit for it. Oh yeah. And, uh, at which, which company is this? My high five. Okay. Yeah. We'll, uh, HR will call you this afternoon with an offer. All right. I'm eager to see what kind of job I get to do as an intern. <laughs>